So we are officially live. I'm Peter Smock, and um, background is a two-time Olympian, and I'm a high-performance coach. I help people get the most out of their minds and, and bodies and in a very spirited way and trying to find the easiest way to do it. Uh, in my own career, I found the hardest way for a while, and then I uh, found some great coaches that helped me find an easier way. So in part, that will be infused within the conversation today. And my colleague is... I am Perpetua. My clients call me Dr. P. I'm a psychologist and coach for high performers or the psychologist for perfectionists. And essentially, I help people to master themselves. I call it mastering your psychological capital, your mind, your time, your energy, your body, your history, you know, basically become the master. Managing is so 2000. We are way over that. And essentially, I help people to rock how they are wired. So it doesn't matter what your personality is and how you're born. We are not asking you to have a personality transplant. We're just helping you to bring the best out of who you are and shine. Awesomeness. So today's topic, we're just going to kind of free flow it here uh, about discipline. And um, it came up in a conversation we had uh, a little bit ago. And uh, like, what is it and how does it serve us? And maybe there's a different way to look at it um, and how it has ramifications in our life that are positive, like pluses and also negatives. And we're, we want to try to stand on the plus side. Uh, I'll start off just by saying that I had some wonderful teachers very early on in my life as a teen who taught me that discipline, uh, the behavior of kind of self-control was uh, something that it was a value. And, and I think grit played a part of that. Grit is kind of like that ability to keep you know, coming back and that per persistence and uh, perseverance. And I very, was very, very grateful for that because that was kind of the, as, as they say in baseball, you know, the sports all have their kind of cliche phrases. But in baseball, they say they're, they're, uh, they're work ethic. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think that having learned that early on, it was a, a great foundational you know, piece to be able to build on. But then uh, something else kind of evolved from there. What's, what was your, what's your personal experience of early on in, in, of discipline and being disciplined? Well, for me, it's always been a battle of discipline. And therefore, you know, I found our conversation earlier on so intriguing. Um, so coming from a Chinese family in Singapore, it's always about having discipline, working hard, having that very strict work ethic. But there was also a part of me that rebelled, you know, maybe because I have ADHD, so it's hard for me to focus. So essentially, you know, I was always trying to find my way towards what we call life hacks today, or Tim Ferriss would call hacking your way, right? So I was always finding my little hacks here and there to realize that I could actually achieve more in less time and with less pain, except that across the years, I never really honored how much I had accomplished because for me, it was about the actual hours. So it's like, I used to beat myself out that I'm not working as hard as everybody else in terms of absolute hours. So I would think I had no discipline. And I guess as well, you know, a part of me was also rebelling against my father as a child. You know, he would always be telling me, you need to be more disciplined. And I was just like, nope, nope, nope. And one day it really hit me that actually I'm a lot more disciplined than most people give me credit for most all that I would give myself credit for to begin with. And I started looking at different parts of my life and decided, you know what, like I, I want more structure. And so I started walking out almost every day. I started walking about seven kilometers daily average outdoors. And I started intermittent fasting and having that structure in my life in the last nine months has actually made me feel a lot more in control of who I am and walking my talk in terms of mastery. Yes, those are great disciplines. I too have uh, uh, been into intermittent fasting for the last couple of years. And as a discipline, it's really been interesting because I think about why I'm doing it and I'm doing it for energy. I'm not doing it for health. Uh, it's simply to feel better more consistently. So I think that one of the, the kind of um, segueing back to where I was coming from earlier is, is you know, how does, it, how does discipline affect you uh, and kind of 
creating those regimens that affect you energetically in a positive way. And I, I think discipline has a, a very, uh, like I said earlier, has had a very positive uh, effect on my life uh, early on and, and still does today. And I think that a great deal of people in my, in my view, especially the young kids who I see, could use more of it, uh, especially the disciplines around you know, taking care of themselves and, and, and kind of what is it, what do they need to do to kind of fill the, uh, the soul of their energy and, and their, their mind and to be more at peace and at calm? You know, what are those things if there's an intention to, to live a, a better, more energized, uh, fulfilling life? What are those things that they can do on their own that take, um, uh, that take time, uh, but, you know, fill you, that, that give to you? And, and I think that that's a discipline. And that takes time and it takes, you know, a great deal of, of uh, compassion for oneself as you learn those, uh, l learn those new disciplines and habits. And I know it was hard for me, you know, uh, you know, to have compassion sometimes when I would fall off, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the, the wagon, if you will, in, in terms of the discipline. But I think it, it for me, it, it started to, to resonate a little bit more about the discipline that it, it has its sways, it has its, it, it has its ups and downs. And I don't mean up and down meaning a negative, ups and downs meaning kind of cyclical that sometimes it's great to have the discipline to, to push and to uh, work harder hour, or longer hours and to you know, get your exercise in every single day because you've been doing it. But I also learned that uh, th there were some times when that didn't serve me. And so as a hard and fast rule of, uh, for me, of always pushing and, and staying in tune in alignment with my discipline as I thought of it, the consistency, uh, sometimes wasn't warranted. And sometimes it wasn't the best to give me the most energy or the most, uh, the, the greatest sense of, you know, fulfillment or, um, you know, just feeling good and, and performing better, especially in the in the performance basis. So, I think that that was the the kind of the next step up with, with uh, discipline is learning that sometimes it's 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 not just a consistent uh, linear line upwards. Absolutely, I think you know what we were talking about that really resonated was how being good to yourself, as you put it, you know, for people who cannot stand about compassion or kindness, is a form of discipline. It's something we need to know and learn. And if we cannot stomach that, maybe we can think of it in terms of how can we recharge our own batteries? Because we are so used to burning out. We are so used to just giving our 150%, um, dismissing everything else as stress and normal, but actually, and running away from our head, self-medicating ourselves, and then completely crashing and burning, and then coming back again, and then crashing and burning. We're so used to this crash and burn cycle, but as the WHO declared, you know, this month itself, burnout is a big problem. You know, Arianna Huffington herself also said that working too hard and exhaustion is not a badge of honor. And so, you know, like coming back to this, most of us have phones, right? And when we have an iPhone, you know, and let's say it's operating below 20% of battery, it starts operating on low power mode. So we have to see it this way, that if we are not good to ourselves and good in a meaningful way, you know, not just unicorn lattes and bubble baths that are Instagrammable, okay? If we're not good to ourselves, then we're going to wake up every day on low power mode. And that's not going to help us in the long run. It's not going to help the people around us. It's not going to help our jobs. It's not going to help us have meaning in our lives. And so if we can contextualize it that way, for my, most of my clients, when they reframe it that way, they actually learn that, you know what, there's a reason towards being good to myself. There is a meaning and value towards it. And so there's a the science behind it. And then they start, start getting on board with it. And so, you know, Peter, how about you tell us about you know, um, what are the different aspects of being good to yourself as a form of discipline? So what should people always look up for? Well, I think of di discipline uh, for me now is the ability to use uh, grit, you know, to use perseverance, to push hard, to, to work uh, hard, but also the discipline to know when it's not serving me. So discipline now has t two meanings for me. And um, 
it ends up being that there's a, a discipline to an alignment of what's good for me, what makes my life work better. And in athletics, it was that uh, the discipline was for um, performance. How do I perform at the highest level, the most consistently, as opposed to who, was, who worked the hardest? And I was in the camp, uh, likewise, of like, oh, everybody's working harder than I am. I, I need to train hard. I need to lift more, and I need to throw the shot more. Yeah. It, and it's about the more. It's not about the performance. And so I came to this point in my athletic career where I was going like, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, what, am, I, what am I using my discipline for? Is it to work or is it to improve you know, my, my performance in my life now, is it, is it to, to work harder or is it to um, improve the lives of my clients or, or my life or, or come, at a play, come from a place of more, greater ease and, and clarity? And so that discipline now has kind of different vector points. It's the ability to push and the ability to say no to things that are not in, in my favor, um, that if I don't feel uh, good. If I have a sore throat, uh, I'm not going to go work out. I'm not going to go get on my bike. I'm going to take a nap. Uh, that's in service of my performance. So I think for people to start thinking of discipline uh, <clears throat> as it could be applied in a, in a different way, and that is that some days less uh, is can give you more. Some days going uh, away from working harder or working out more or, um, you know, maybe someday you need a, a sweet roll instead of, uh, you know, at nine o'clock in the morning instead of being on your intermittent fasting. Uh, and this is me. I do this on Sunday. Uh, you know, I just allow myself to to have the sweet roll. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's fine. I feel fine. And I, I feel good that I'm being good to myself. So, Discipline as another way of taking care of oneself, um, I think it starts to be really relevant when you start thinking in terms of incremental gains, that in the process of, of becoming better, more fulfilled in your life, um, enhancing your performance if you're an athlete, that it's incremental and that the habits that you use and discipline um, are there to help you stay on this course of just like a little bit, a little bit more today, a little bit more today, a little bit more today. And I'll, I'll, I'll end this little piece with a, a client who's a CEO and that has started working with me. And we have this workout plan that he's doing. And um, he was involved in, in investor uh, acquisition and in, in a conference back east and, and traveling a lot and, and doing a big deal with uh, a large uh, software company. And, you know, he just didn't have the energy, but he got up and he stretched. We have some of these stretching kind of ritual movements in the morning. And he did those in the morning and going like, this is enough. This is what I have to give to this today. I can't do the full 30-minute workout, but I can do this for, for five minutes. And that discipline, just incrementally, was enough to kind of feed him and to keep him coming back. Totally. I know I think like just to backtrack a little bit, what you're basically saying and to reiterate that, would be the importance of not doing something blindly, to be very aware of what drives you. So, you know, for instance, it's not about doing more and comparing yourself to the absolute number of hours everybody is doing something. How do you know they're not doing things blindly as well? You know, it's so easy to do anything in this world for any reason because it's trendy, because somebody told you to do that. But if you look deep inside yourself, you know, like some days you need a sweet roll. Some days I go for 17 course tasting menu because I want to. It's not going to kill me. It's going to actually make me feel better because the dopamine is going to start to flood my brain. Okay. And I'm going to feel like, wow, this is a sweet reward. I'm going to keep at what I'm doing because right. it's worth it. You know? And the second thing, when you talk about incremental steps, I think that is so important because we often forget the context that we are in. So we just keep pushing ourselves and we are so black and white, inflexible, and then we get really punitive with ourselves. And we all know that when we are nasty to ourselves, our fear center, our amygdala and our brain starts firing away like crazy. We get really angry. We feel like we're under threat. Cortisol, adrenaline starts to surge and we just don't feel good. We are, feel, we are tight, we're anxious. It's a terrible thing to do. 
And I just love how, you know, your CEO was just stretching because I think about how I tell my clients that when you're on holiday and you cannot do anything, go for a walk instead, you know, or don't get a driver, <laughs> walk a little bit more. Right. And so when I'm on holiday, I don't have my kettlebells. I do a workout according to my own body weight and it works. And that's a really relevant with regards to how I always teach my clients, you know, like it's so easy to think I can just read all the books I want in the world and buy all the online courses. But why is it that we all don't get shit done? It's because everything feels so overwhelming unless you make it incremental. So how I always describe work to, working with my clients is you imagine this, you buy a gym and it's great. It's good soundproofing. It's got good ventilation. It's got lovely smells but you're not just going to chuck all sorts of shit inside all sorts of crazy equipment. You're going to curate the equipments that are the best and suited to your body. So every week you're going to add in one equipment, learn it well, and then we're going to add the next one. So everything's on autopilot the next time you do it. So the mental gym is how I call any kind of work. And you know, I think that's so important. It's a metaphor in terms of incremental steps. Yes. The, um, the incremental steps, I think, are also <clears throat> another important factor is that when, when you're uh, allowing yourself to just do a body weight workout with, without your kettlebells or to do a little bit less or to, do, um, to have the, the multi-course meal, is that, that the other part of discipline is the discipline of not allowing your mind to dissuade you from that. Because if we're... Most of us are that probably will listen to this have achieved things. You and I have have achieved things. We're 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 successful in that way. And when you do something uh, on this path, and it's not the discipline, the level of discipline that you've done in the past, and you allow yourself to back off, or you allow yourself just to stretch for five minutes, you allow yourself to have the seventeenth course meal you allow yourself to have the sweet roll, that the mind that comes in, the thoughts that you have, that you're not following your discipline, that you're not being disciplined, that you're being lazy, that you're being less than what you have thought you should be, <coughs> excuse me, needs to be, there needs to be a discipline in not allowing that to take over. So as you become more attentive and more aware of your body and giving it what it needs, maybe the sweet roll is what you need or the body weight workout, that you also have to be attentive to the mind and your thoughts that come in that say that you shouldn't be doing that. And I think an example that I heard within the last month is Tim Ferriss, uh, you know, a kind of a influencer in, in many ways. Um, and it's still a young guy at, at 38. I think he's still experimenting with his life. And he was doing a podcast with another guy who I follow occasionally. And he was, they were talking about meditation. And the other guy, Peter Atia, uh, said, who's a doctor, and he said, well, have you tried meditation? And he said, well, you know, I am, I'm, I'm, I am now, I think he said. But when I first thought about it, he said, I thought if I'd meditated, I would lose my edge. If I meditated, I would lose my edge. And so that's the kind of thinking around discipline. He's a very disciplined guy. I bet he works really, really hard. He doesn't take much time off, I bet. But he was thinking that if he went in this other direction and meditated, that he would actually lose something, that there would be a negative effect. And it's like, no, man, that's not the way it works. I'm, I'm glad you're finding that out because you're going to find that you're kind of going on another level up into how you achieve things in your life and being good to yourself and what discipline is. Well, you know, that's so funny because with so many <coughs> people, whenever we have our first call, it's always this, I said, so you're kind of over afraid that if you take some time to rejuvenate and recharge yourself, you're going to go soft, right? You're kind of afraid that if you take some time just to breathe, you're just going to go soft. Stay not yeah. ahead. You're afraid that if you are kind to yourself, just a little bit good with yourself, you're going to go soft. They all nod their heads. Yes, you know, I know. 
like that. And you know what? I, it really makes me laugh. We can laugh not because, you know, it's funny, but because that was exactly how I was. When I was first introduced to the term self-compassion, I was just like, what bloody bullshit is that? Because, you know, from Singapore, brought up by the stick, not the carrot, or I always thought that reverse psychology is the only thing that works. So you tell me to be compassionate with myself. Are you bloody mad? <laughs> It was the first thing in my head. Then I came across this research that looked at higher performers. And what they found was people, they, they looked at high performers who were nasty to themselves and high performers who were kind to themselves. And contrary to every expectation I had, okay, the second group was actually the ones that outperformed the first group. And with being kind to themselves, being able to take care of their resilience and mental health and everything else, you can imagine that they probably have more fulfilling relationships with other people and themselves and probably sleep so well. So that bit of research was the science that got my cerebral brain to turn around thinking that, you know what, it's going to feel weird, but I'm going to try that. So I totally get what Tim Ferriss is saying. And that is so funny because I think that, you know, as all of us who are high performers, who are very hard on ourselves, perfectionists and type A, to tell us to suddenly chill a little bit, not chill totally, and be good to ourselves, do this tiny little bit like rest, reward ourselves, that can feel bloody terrifying. Well, I think what you just said about you're going to try it and you're going to see. And I think that if there's one thing that, that, that I could, you know, have to kind of instill in people is this idea of, of try it and see. Mm. See what happens. See if there's one thing you can do today that is something in, in, uh, that will feed you in a way that will give you greater uh, energy, that will give you a time out, that will give you greater clarity of mind, whether it's walking around the block or taking three deep breaths, something that puts a wedge into this idea that you have to keep going at a, at a, at a high speed level of, of doing and see what happens. Um, literally, I, I, the biggest thing that I can share is that it comes from my performance that I was about a year away from my, making my first Olympic team. I didn't know I was going to make it. And I would get so angry at myself. You know, I didn't know what the word compassion was back then, but I was so uh, uncompassionate with myself. And uh, I would get so angry at myself for not being able to, to rise up and, and, and have my body do more than what it could do on a particular day, even though it was exhausted. And in that time period, which was about two years, um, I had the, the results were, were flatlined. I had made no progress. So I was kind of on autopilot. I was working really hard, thinking I needed to work harder. I was lifting more weights. I was throwing more often. I was disregarding how my body actually felt. And then I was getting pissed off at myself because I, I couldn't live up to the standard that I wanted to. And um, when I started to meditate, I started breathing exercises. When I started to follow some other teachers and mentors and, and some books that kind of landed in my lap from the great, you know, the gifts from the great whatever, uh, I started to find a way to, to have more time out to vary my workouts more to have easier days, to rest more, to recover, and to be more mentally <clears throat> at peace with myself. So when the voices came up that said, oh, no, you need to do this, what is wrong with you, uh, that I would just disregard them. It's like, you know, just watching a movie instead of being a part of it. And, uh, and all of a sudden, the throws that I had started to become easier. And there was more rhythm to the, and my internal messaging was much more quiet and, and pleasant to, to myself. I was being more compassionate to myself. And um, I started throwing farther. Yeah. And as I started to throw farther, I was having more fun. So you, you, I step back and look at it today and I'm going like, yeah, okay, so I was m more compassionate with myself, meaning I was more attentive to what my body needed. I was less uh, driven by my mind that said I needed to do more. I took more time off when I needed it. I slept in more, did breath meditation, started to throw further. That was the goal, to throw further, not to work harder. And I had more fun. So what if we could all do uh, start to fall in line of a practice and follow a practice like that you've talked about that I've mentioned where 
we achieve higher levels, but do it with greater ease and with more compassion to ourselves. And then we have more fun as opposed to the whole process being one of like drudgery every single day versus, hey, this is fun. I'm making progress and I feel good. Yeah. You know, it's like how when I was first classically training on the piano um, in Singapore, like you're always told things like you've got to play your skills for one hour. So I was just playing it for one hour. It was just terrible. I mean, I'm sure I cheated to make it half an hour, but it was absolutely ter terrible. So classical music became something very mechanical for me. And I hated that. So, you know, I can totally get it. Well, right, right now, you know, as I grew up many years later, now classical music is very different for me. I have a new appreciation because I trust my fingers to do the skills. And actually, now when I have a piano, I'll gladly play the skills. But in the past, you couldn't pay me to pay it, to play it. So, you know, I think that what's really related here is actually being able to trust ourselves that when we treat ourselves or when we are kind to ourselves, we're not going to suddenly tumble down that path of no return where we sway completely to the other side. You know, it's something that I write about quite a bit. I call it the apocalypse brain. You know, in, in, in psychology, we say something like, when you're anxious, you catastrophize. But what I find is that when you're very anxious, you don't just catastrophize. You live in apocalypse. Like everything is always the worst bloody case scenario and just blown out of proportion. So you kind of feel like, okay, if I have that tiny piece of cake, then I'm just going to lose my entire discipline. I'm going to lose my routine. Then I'm going to think, heck it, and I'm not going to run again, or I'm not going to lift my kettlebells again. You know, this is like big fear. But I think fundamentally, it's about trusting ourselves that actually we have enough discipline that got us to where we are. And, we, and because we already have discipline in some parts of our lives, it's a transferable skill, which means that this sweet bread I'm having, the 17 course meal that I'm having, is not the end of the world. It's actually going to propel me towards appreciating myself and saying thank you for actually being where I am today. And so I'm going to keep working towards bringing myself to greater heights and bringing the people who have supported me along with me. Yep. I just, you know, big thumbs up. That's such a right on right on way of explaining it. Um, incremental gains, um, being kind to yourself, um, all of these things that you've said that I've mentioned are part of just a, a life practice. Mm -hmm. I'm still practicing. Yeah. You know, I'm not throwing a shot put anymore, but I'm still practicing. And it's a, uh, you know, the, the, the just do it of Nike is just do it for your life in a way that e is easier than not and, uh, and enjoy the process. So I don't think there's anything more that I can say about um, how, to, how to begin your own practice of, you know, finding an easier way of being good to yourself. <clears throat> Absolutely. And you know what, I, then I would like to talk about having a nap. Because remember, we did talk about mm -hmm. that and how important it is. So we all know that sleep, deep sleep is important because every day when whatever we do, imagine you step out of a house into a cafe, there's a lot of stimulation. So what more if you go into a really bustling city? That's, you're just bombarded. So when we sleep deeply, what happens is our brain manages to clear all the junk and all the gunk that is irrelevant for us. So it's like, you know, imagine yourself having a, a cupboard and your cupboard is just cluttered with full of shit. When you sleep, your brain clears out all that shit so that you can organize it if you want to when you're awake, right? So it becomes one of those beautifully organized cupboard set. Right. <laughs> upon, you know, on Instagram, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, things like that make me very excited. So we know that sleep is really important. At the same time, naps are also really important, even if we don't just launch straight into deep sleep. And so, you know, why don't you share with us about, you know, your napping philosophy? Well, naps became an integral part of my, my life uh, during my, my days of, of competing. And it was that every day um, I would take, you know, probably longer than I do today, probably a, a nap that was 30 minutes, maybe even 45 minutes. And that was, you know, typically right around 1 o'clock, 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock. The training session started in the afternoon, a little bit later. So... Uh, and, and I, they were just rejuvenating. And the other thing, they were rejuvenating in a way that got me out of my head. So it was like one, on, one, uh, on one level, it was like, 
this was restorative. This was a, a moment of resting my brain and resting my body. On the other hand, it was kind of a, a wedge into my day that I would stop thinking about what I had done and what I was going to do. I didn't use naps as a, as a, a moment to think about things. I used it, uh, little did I know at the time, as a wedge. And it was a wedge in between the kind of the continuity of the entire day. And it gave me greater perspective. It, great, it gave me greater insight. It, great, it gave me a greater sense of, of being in touch with my body. Like, what did it need? You know, do you need more fuel? Do you need less? And so naps have been a part of my life ever since. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't need you know, 45 minutes, you know, 20 minutes laying on a, I do it where I lay on a, on a hard floor, like a yoga mat where I work. Uh, I don't fall into REM sleep. Uh, you know, I don't fall into the level of sleep where you get up and you're groggy and you're kind of irritable. It's just enough to, to kind of pull away from, uh, you know, kind of daily uh, consciousness and all of a sudden like 20 20 minutes later 25 minutes later it's like get up and like wow I feel great I'm, I'm ready to go on to the second half of my day and, uh, and I have never fortunately I have never thought of that I am being unproductive during this like no this is needed this is this makes me better <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna do it I'm gonna fight for it wherever I can Absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, naps have such a bad name as though we are lazy. And you just think about that in terms of restorativeness. What I realized is that in my life, whenever sometimes I feel a bit like car sick, because I do get motion sickness, especially if I have to direct, direct, I have to give directions at the same time. And I'm terrible at directions, right? So it gives me a headache. Then I get motion sickness. And then I know I feel terrible. Or there was even this time when I knew that I was going to fall sick. Um, I was starting to run a temperature and I was in Disneyland. So, you know, that's not, I was at Disneyland celebrating the completion of my last ever thesis. So, you know, that's not a day when you want to actually fall sick. So I told my friend, you know what? <laughs> I feel my body shutting down. So you go take one ride. I'm going to hide in a dark theater and I'm going to nap for 10 minutes. And you come look for me after that. Because I knew from experience that the moment my body just drifts off into a nap and I wake up, I'm much better. So basically, every time whether I'm having car sickness or when I know my body is shutting down, I just go somewhere and hide for 10 minutes and I come back alive again. How, do you, how does that happen? How do you think that, not that, it, not that it's, the bottom line is that it works for you, but how, does, how do you think that happens? How do you think that works? Because I think that, you know, when I can feel everything shutting down or when I can feel myself being really tense because, for instance, I am having motion sickness, I start to feel a bit panicky because nobody wants to be motion sick, right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, like, oh, for instance, I'm in Disneyland and I paid so much money to get in. I'm celebrating the end of my thesis. I don't want to disappoint my friend. We've woken up so early to take the train all the way in. So all these thoughts start piling up in my head. So I know that once I nap, my brain shuts down and I get to come back into my body, I stop panicking, and then that's when the magic begins. So, of course, you know, I think like my cells are doing maybe a very, very quick, you know, instantaneous cleanup of whatever they're doing, but I know that when I wake up, I'm okay. It's a very strange thing, but that's like, you know, when you talk about naps, it really attests to how much I totally glorify naps. <laughs> Well, and the fact that you have that turnaround in, the, in a short period of time, I mean, what a huge, you know, gift of a practice, knowing that you can do that. I mean, that, that is so, you know, if everybody listens to what you have to say and, and can apply that just once this next week and just see what, uh, what, what happens with that, that's a profound way of, of kind of uh, realizing your, how to feel better and, and, and your best self uh, in, in only 10 minutes. I mean, it doesn't take much time. Yeah, I know. It's like when you find a way that you can heal yourself, it's basically you spend the time to buy more time back. So for instance, you know, like some, I don't, I'm very lucky that I have designed my life in a way where I don't need to work crazy hours every day. But on some days, you know, maybe I'm writing or I've got a lot of different things to do different errands in my personal life. So I get really busy and I think I just have to keep charging on. But what I realized is as long as I spend that time, that 10 minutes to nap, I buy back more time. I buy back my vitality. And actually, instead of running on low power mode, 
for six hours, I'm actually running at 80%, 90% battery just by snapping for that 10 minutes. And that makes a hell of a difference again. So, you know, I think that quite often we just think we got to keep charging to the finish line. We think that to pause is a sign of weakness, but actually it isn't. It's a bit like, you know, how I watch some sports strategies and it says that, you know, initially what you can do is you run a bit slower. And sometimes even in terms of, say, a kind of tactical game or strategy, everybody thinks that you're really slow. And then during the last bit, you totally sprint because everybody's tired. They mm-hmm. think that you are floundering behind and actually even conserving your energy. And then all the, you go all the way to the front and you win it. So in the same way, you know, it's all about spending this little bit of time, whether it's napping or breathing. I always tell my clients this. If you have time to go to the bathroom, if you have time to touch your phone, to check Instagram, then you've got time to breathe. And that's something no one can argue with. No, you can't argue with that. And I, I would just uh, probably, probably leave with saying what I, uh, my CEO a client uh, who's also a marketer and was saying about this this process uh, my my brand is called life athlete and, and about this uh, step up in achievement and he said you know we've all learned to work and achieve at at a foundational level uh, by pushing and by working really hard you know having the discipline to to go beyond what our minds and our body uh, say that we can he said, but I, I have always believed that there was another, there was another level. Mm-hmm. I always believe that, so is this all there is uh, as a question? And then, no, I don't think that there is. But, and his description of it was this ability to uh, be aware of ourselves in a more kind and compassionate way, uh, to do things incrementally, and that that was the way to the next level up. So it was, you know, in terms of an evolution of of how one achieves or performs in life, that that was the foundation, just being disciplined and working hard. And then there's the next step up. Yeah. And that that step is, you know, allowing yourself to, you know, to take the nap and to give to you and not buying in that, uh, you know, that exhaustion is a, a status symbol. And that uh, has made such a difference in his life. And that made, you know, I already described, made a huge difference in my life. So I think if there's anything that uh, I, I'm hoping that people get out of what we're talking about, what we're sharing today, is that it's, there is a next level up if you, if you are willing to, you know, to just taste it. You know, take that five-minute nap, take those three breaths instead of looking at your Instagram account and see what the effects are and know that, you know, that life can be a lot easier and you can still, <clears throat> excuse me, perform at a very high level. <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, like, this is totally the redefining discipline, the Jedi way. And I think that when you do it the Jedi way, There is also this bit on having to reframe all the things that you reward yourself with. You know, the nap, the sweet bread, you know, it's really not about just being excessive or hedonistic. Yeah, there could be that part of you. I know I'm quite hedonistic sometimes, but you should also always see this as because I can. And here I am celebrating the fruits of my labor. This is where I've reached a life where I am actually disciplined enough to eat that sweet bread or the sweet roll every Sunday, or I can have that, you know, um, three Michelin star, 17 course tasting menu once every three months because I can. And I think there's much to be said about being able to celebrate that kind of like, you know, Tim Ferriss would talk about the jar of awesome. It's about all the accomplishments that you've had that mean something to you that you're going to celebrate because it's testament to how far you have come. Yes. Yeah, celebration is something that I never did much of, but I would, I would agree with you that everyone should, has something to celebrate every single day. And that's finding that one thing, and it doesn't matter how small you think it is, but to celebrate it, and that's, that's giving to you. So yeah. any uh, final words um, that you'd like to say? No, I would just say that that's an easier way out, the Jedi way that we put it. And 
that all we have to do is just to be curious enough to try it because in life we have experimented with so many things so there's really no harm in just experimenting in three breaths or taking a short nap and there's no harm in being able to listen to the wisdom of your body but then to, then to always be stuck in your head because much as we are evolved to be you know creatures of higher intellect as compared to the cow you know <laughs> or the pig right you know there's <laughs> much to be said about how animals have got this wisdom of returning to their bodies and there's a lot about how we can learn from that as well to rise above all this you know um to be human is to think and to be anxious kind of afflictions i don't think we we're born just to be anxious even though anxiety is so prevalent i think we're also born to be the best versions of ourselves for ourselves and for the people we love i'm gonna leave it with that i can't do better than that that was awesome um so uh thank you Perpetua, and thanks everybody for listening. And we'll be back with more in the future. If you like this, just give us a thumbs up, subscribe, wherever you hear this, wherever you listen to this. Just let us know that you like it and uh, put in your comments too about what's going on with you, your life, what you've experimented with, um, what works for you, what you're dealing with, what are your challenges, and uh, we will respond as we can. Until next time, see y'all. Ciao.